Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Interplanetary Project Transmission Webinar, where we will share with you a glimpse into the projects advancing our space future supported here at the Interplanetary Initiative. My name is Jessica Rousset. I am the Deputy Director at Interplanetary Initiative, and um, I'll be your host for today. Now, for those of you uh, who are not joining us for the first time and have been following our webinars, you might be expecting our inspirational leader, Dr. Lindy Elkins-Tanton, Vice President of the Interplanetary Initiative. Uh, she sends her regrets and she's with us all in spirit. She is currently at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory focused on, of course, the uh, NASA Psyche mission. So for today, I will be guiding you through a really jam-packed program uh, where we're gonna be hearing about a lot of the exciting projects that we have been supporting uh, this past year and then that we're gonna be launching this upcoming year. Um, so a few housekeeping items before we get started. Of course, today is a Zoom webinar format. So uh, you all who are joining and filtering in here, I'm seeing uh, folks are still uh, joining us, welcome. Um, you will be seen but muted by default. We also got some very specific feedback from our last webinar that um, it would be wonderful for us to, uh, to shorten our webinars to a one hour format. So we will do our best to get everything um, done within the hour, but uh, that means that we are going to uh, omit the Q&A. Um, that said, we're gonna give you lots of opportunities con to connect with our speakers and with Interplanetary. And of course, we very much want to hear from you, answer your questions and hopefully engage with you uh, in the year to come on uh, many of these projects. Um, a few tips there for best viewing our webinar. And then lastly, uh, likely tomorrow, please look out for an email from us. You'll get a recording of the webinar and an invitation to fill out a quick feedback survey that we um, take very seriously. So we want to make these you know, as impactful and meaningful for you. And we appreciate the time, the short amount of time it takes to, it takes to submit and fill those surveys. All right. So um, also, in terms of what to expect for this next year, we're switching things up a little bit. We're going to move back to a quarterly cadence with our project transmission webinars because there's a lot of great, exciting things happening in Interplanetary. We want to make sure we communicate as much uh, to you as possible. And so now we're going to be having these quarterly um, webinars. They will be split up in sort of two themes in the fall and in the spring. We'll bring you updates on our educational programs. Uh, what's happening at the Interplanetary Lab, which is really expanding and doing some extraordinary work. And lastly, uh, we'll give you updates on new and existing partnerships. And then in the winter, in December and in the spring, uh, now in, in June, uh, we will be focusing on our interdisciplinary intersector pilot projects. All right. For today, um, I'm going to just kick things off by welcoming some of our new team members that joined us since December. And then we will um, uh, very briefly for this one, uh, we will uh, hear from our director of learning, uh, Catherine McConaughey, that's gonna, who's gonna give you some updates on our educational programs. But then we'll move into very quickly all of our projects. Very excited to introduce our very first interplanetary fellow and the work that she's been doing. And then we'll move into the projects that have been um, taking place this year and some of the new projects that we'll tee up for next year. So first, I'd like to welcome Juana Garcia. She is our new business operations manager. Uh, Juana has been at ASU for a number of years. She comes to us by way of the uh, School of Earth and Space Exploration. She has tremendous experience and a wonderful spirit, and we're really thrilled to have her be part of our team. Um, and our latest addition and team member is Chase Castle. He's a portfolio manager. and. He has a very interesting background. He's been in politics. He's been in the private sector and the cybersecurity space. And he's now an active student in actually the Thunderbirds uh, master's program for space leadership, uh, business and policy. And he, uh, as portfolio manager, is going to be involved in many projects that we're moving forward, including the ones you're going to hear all about today. So before we kick things off on the, on the project side, I'd like to introduce Catherine McConaughey, our Director of Learning, for some quick updates on our uh, educational programs. Catherine, all yours. Awesome. 
Thanks, Jessica, and thanks everyone for being here today. I'm really excited to tell you a little bit about some of the exciting things we've been up to working with students and our education programs and our learning efforts here at Interplanetary. So the first big announcement is that starting this fall, we do have a brand new technological leadership minor. This is available both online and on ground, and we think it's a great fit for our ASU students who are looking to enhance their current field of study, their current major, with key skills in collaborative research, technology, de technology design, and interdisciplinary leadership. Um, and this is a great opportunity for students who are interested in space or just sort of the future of science and technology to join us some of our courses. <clears throat> Um, excuse me. So this fall, I also wanted to let everyone know we've got some great courses lined up as we usually do. Um, and we invite students from all majors and degree programs to join us. Um, in our inquiry class this uh, semester, our on ground students will be exploring how we can design equitable cities in space. We also have some fantastic hands on making courses like our IPI 241 designing and making for an interplanetary future which introduces students to the fundamentals of building technology and small satellites in makerspace settings. And we have a wonderful class from our collaborators over at Herberger called Creative Future Studio. Um, where you focus more on sort of the design and development of creative ventures. So I encourage all of you who are students or who work with students to check out one of our courses. Um, I also wanted to just give a quick shout out to our two fantastic interplanetary initiative graduates. Um, we have Matthew Atkins, who was um, one of our lead lifeguards in the interplanetary laboratory who graduated this May with his master's degree in mechanical engineering. Um, we're super proud of all he's done and he's going on to a fantastic role at Blue Origin. Um, and so we're very excited to be sending him off into the world. And also we had our very second, our second graduate for technological leadership, um, Miles English, who's wrapping up a really exciting internship this summer um, with the Department of Technology in Washington, DC. Um, but after he wraps that up, he'll be, um, yes, as, as I said, our very second graduate. Um, so again, wishing them both uh, a lot of good wishes as they go out into the world. And then finally, um, for those of you who might be ASU online students, who um, work with ASU online students, we are starting a brand new program this fall to have more of our ASU online students invo involved in the pilot projects that you're gonna hear a little bit about um, right after this. So if you are interested in that, please um, check out this website or send me an email. Um, we'd love to get you involved in, in space research. So thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And yes, we are very excited to be able to include our online researchers, online students in some of these research, research projects. <clears throat> so next, I'd like to introduce Theodora Ogden. Um, as I mentioned earlier, she's our very first interplanetary fellow. Um, a little bit about Theodora. She's a defense and security analyst at RAND Europe, where she conducts research on emerging technologies, space strategy, and policy. And I'd like to say that um, uh, Theodore really set the bar high as our inaugural fellow. She um, was extremely prolific in the time she spent with us and focusing on um, looking at emerging spacefaring nations and, uh, and how to ensure more equitable access to space. So Theodore, thanks for uh, joining us today and uh, sharing a little bit about your work. Hi, thanks very much. Um, so yeah, um, I was very um, fortunate to be selected as the 2022 fellow at the II. Um, so during my uh, five month secondment from RAND, uh, my research focused on equitable access to space and um, emerging space faring nations um, towards producing a final public report as well as a few smaller um, offshoot publications. Um, so the final report has um, four sort of key research areas which all um, contribute to the overarching goal of fostering the principle of space as the um, province of humankind. Um, so the multi-step research process involved um, firstly 
a legal analysis of the existing framework around access to geostationary orbits, um, identifying gaps and areas in need of further research. Um, so uh, the uh, 1967 Outer Space Treaty was drafted in the context of the Cold War, um, partly to prevent war in space. Um, so it does not sufficiently account for today's um, rapidly evolving space sector and the emerging uses for space, um, particularly resource extraction. Um, so there's therefore a need to clarify the various interpretations of the international legal principles and assess the existing regimes and instruments. Um, the second objective um, is the case study analysis of um, four emerging spacefaring countries. Um, so I looked at Brazil, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, and South Korea. Um, so understanding these contexts facilitates a broader perspective um, that helps foster a more equitable and inclusive space domain. Um, so um, the four standalone analyses provide a sort of overview of the strengths and challenges, um, shedding light on some of the issues facing the emerging spacefaring community. Um, so taken together, these case studies represent um, the broader landscape illustrating um, space industry economy and security concerns on um, four continents. Um, the third objective assesses the benefits of a more equitable and inclusive space community, um, pointing out the various additions that new actors can bring in terms of innovation, um, novel uh, market opportunities and so forth. Um, so more space players could mean a greater number of unique geographic access points to launch payloads into orbit, um, which could um, hold potential um, benefits and a proliferation of space actors and more demand for upstream and downstream products and services could um, help drive economies of scale um, and potentially enhance uh, efficiency and compet competition in, in um, global supply chains in the international space market. Um, so this objective also looks at the importance of um, space to developing countries in spurring economies and propelling technological and industry advancements. Um, there are also a couple risks to consider, um, which need to be balanced against these benefits. Um, so we looked at um, the lower barrier of or to conflict in the space domain and um, fewer human costs compared to war on Earth. Um, so, the, and then the final part kind of looks at the good practices for developing countries seeking access to space. Um, so this um, drew on a couple of um, um, case study analyses, as well as um, consulting with industry leaders, academics and policy experts in interviews. Um, next slide, please. Um, so just to quickly sort of summarise the recommendations that um, I provide to policymakers, um, there's no single blueprint, um, but generally the, the overarching recommendations are to establish a clear national space policy or strategy, um, ensure steady space funding, um, invest in uh, human capital and specialise in niche technology areas, um, balance public and commercial space activities, um, foster international collaboration and engage with um, space law and governance. Um, so the report is fully available online. Um, it's geared towards um, researchers, policymakers, and members of the public who simply wish to inform themselves about emerging space faring nations. Um, so I hope that this project overall serves as a building block for future research and advances um, equitable access to space that can ult ultimately uh, benefit all of uh, human and scientific advancement. Many thanks. Thank you so much, Theodora. And, um, uh, we put in the chat a link to uh, Theodore's report, if you would like to read that. And one also comment here uh, related to that grant that Catherine just shared uh, with you. Um, we are going to build on the work that Theodore is doing to dig into more of the technology sort of dimensions of how space benefits um, emerging uh, spacefaring countries. Um, and that will be, we'll be recruiting online students to help with that project. So a shout out there uh, for anyone interested to connect with Catherine. <clears throat> okay. So uh, let's move into our interplanetary pilot project. So as a quick reminder, I spoke to this briefly uh, in December at our last transmission webinar. We invest in uh, interdisciplinary cross-sector projects that emanate from a very specific 
uh, process or methodology that we call the big questions teaming methodology, which manifests as a, um, a part participation in a two hour workshop that we run uh, several times a year and through which uh, participants will brainstorm the biggest questions around space uh, exploration, transportation, habitation, form, uh, pick, pick the most compelling, uh, form teams, and then start to identify specific milestones and deliverables that could be achieved within a one year time frame to start tackling these big questions. Um, we then have teams come back to us after a, a short amount of time to sort of refine their thinking and their team and their goals and request funding. So that's how we launch our projects. And so what I wanted to do here before we go into the presentations is to uh, sort of pan out a little bit and share with you what the ultimate sort of impact and goal is that we're seeking with these investments. So starting off to the, uh, the left of this uh, graph, we launch projects through participation in these workshops. We then provide a little bit of seed funding where, to projects that form in this way, where there is an ASU faculty lead. We typically will fund for a year, but we may, we may extend that support depending on um, how the projects evolve. And we provide a lot of project management support. Um, and uh, Chase uh, Castle, our new portfolio manager, will serve uh, in this role. Um, and to make sure that really all the goals are being met. And then really importantly, um, we want our projects to quote unquote graduate. We want them to continue on beyond the initial small amount of support that they get from interplanetary financial support uh, to continue on and be validated through partnerships with other funding sources or collaborators. Um, and then um, ultimately we want uh, the impact to scale. And when we speak of, of impact, the outputs of these research projects, as you're going to see, can take many different forms. Um, it can be more traditional sort of academic output like publications and talks, but we are quite agnostic as to how um, the, this work manifests in terms of reaching as many people as possible in the world, but that is the ultimate goal. Uh, sometimes these projects are so sort of broad initially that they splinter off into many new types of lines of inquiry and projects, and that is uh, we consider that very success, a successful outcome, and you'll see a few examples of that uh, today. And then my last point here, I'm sorry, if we could go back. Uh, just the last point I want to make is uh, after doing this for, for close to five years now, we uh, do estimate that this, this process has been validated insofar as uh, for every dollar that we've invested in these seed projects, um, they have returned close to $8 in follow-on grants, contracts, and royalties. Okay, now we can move on to the next. Thank you, Sally. So we're really excited to uh, be supporting these new projects in fiscal 23, which for us starts in July, so right around the corner. Um, I'm going to give you a little teaser for uh, about each of these, uh, but I do invite you to join us in December when the team leads will be presenting on their progress. They will have six months uh, under their belt of advancing uh, these projects targeting a number of really exciting big questions. So I will go into the first, which is uh, that we're at the moment referring to as no space wars. And this is a very cer certainly critical and timely big question, which is how can we reduce the probability of cataclysmic space war? Um, this project is going to be led by Daniel Rothenberg. Um, he's a professor of practice in our School of Politics and Global Studies, and he's the co-director of the Center on the Future of War. We're really excited about the sort of the coalition of collaborators that have come together for this particular project. We have individuals from NASA, from Space Force, from the private industry like Health Hess Corporation, Lockheed Martin, Aerospace Corporation. Uh, Theodora from RAND will be involved, and then we have academics from Oxford University, Flinders University, just to name a few. So um, uh, this is going to be quite an exciting project that's going to focus on hosting an international convening that's going to bring together experts and stakeholders in three topics. First, understanding the consequences and pathways to conflict in space. Second, to uh, look at how can we best use open source intelligence for space domain awareness. And then thirdly, um, maybe the most complex of all, understanding how space, space ownership, and space conflict is conceptualized socially, politically, and culturally. 
Um, so please tune in with us in December to learn more about that project. Um, next is um, a project that we're calling Space Activity Heat Map. And the impetus behind this project was what's, what are the key drivers for all of the activity that's happening in space and how has that evolved over time? And so, um, and so here, uh, this is a project that's going to be led by Chris Bryan. He's an assistant professor at the School of Computing and Augmented Intelligence here at ASU. Again, with a very interesting team of collaborators with participants from uh, XPRIZE Foundation, Planetary Resources, Maxar Technologies, the Smithsonian Institution, and uh, we also have some artists that are going to join in this project. But briefly, what the project is going to develop is a geographic heat map that's publicly accessible um, with an online web dashboard that is going to help visualize the current space activities through the lens of their key benefits, drivers, and the end goals. And that's going to be tracked at the project level over time, investment level, and geographic location. And so um, we believe that with a project like this and a product like this, uh, we will have a really effective way of communicating the impact of space activities, number one, but also to uh, engage a broader set of stakeholders uh, so that they can take part in shaping future projects, understanding sort of where we are today. Next project is uh, JEDI space. And um, by and large, the commercial space sector is still nascent and growing, and we have an incredible opportunity and duty and responsibility um, to um, help direct and guide this industry towards a more just, equitable, and diver diverse and inclusive uh, space for all humanity. Uh, this is a really important project. It's being led by Dr. Angela Gonzalez. She's an associate professor at our School of Social Transformation. Uh, other team members are uh, Dr. Cyan Proctor, uh, a civilian astronaut who is uh, also going to be um, doing some closer work at ASU. We're very excited about that. We have collaborators from Qualtech, from XPRIZE Foundation, and from SpaceKind. Briefly, the overarching goal, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry long-term goals for this project are to one, develop a globally informed understanding of what Jedi space means to all types of people on Earth. Secondly, to increase opportunities for more people to see themselves in space exploration and our collective uh, space future. And then lastly, to cultivate a shared commitment of accountability for companies, organizations, and institutions to uphold the shared values of a Jedi space. So during this year, there's going to be a lot of interviews and surveys and conversations to define sort of what we mean by a Jedi space and then to create a common framework that we can build upon. Next project. Um, so this project is a uh, spin-off or has splintered off of our Five Senses in Space project, which we have been supporting for a number of years. And that's been extremely prolific in terms of the number of products that have emerged from, uh, from this project. And uh, we will hear from Laura Gold in a moment about all the exciting um, outcomes from Five Senses in Space. We are very excited about Mars on the field. Um, we also have new leadership for this project uh, and uh, two very talented faculty, uh, Laura uh, Shahanovitz and D.B. Bauer. They're both assistant professors in the School of Arts, Media and Engineering. And just like this, group, this team, this uh, Five Senses project has been very successful in doing in the past. They're bringing together a very broad and diverse coalition of collaborator collaborators. Briefly, what this project is going to propose doing is to take, uh, to create an immersive, walkable virtual reality experience that takes place in a large sort of physical space. I think we have our eyes here on the Sun Devil Stadium field, but really could be applied to any type of large uh, public space. Um, so just imagine users, in this case, sort of beginning at one end zone when, where they can sort of walk through an experience where they explore the history of human understanding of Mars, uh, starting with Earth-based observational data, and then um, uh, looking at the Mars through the lens of rovers, and then ultimately looking at perhaps an, uh, um, an imaginative future of Mars exploration through the eyes of um, and, and the lens of a crewed mission and habitation. And last but not least, Space Hack for Sustainability. This is also a spinoff from um, a uh, project that we funded this fiscal year. You'll hear more from uh, Madison 
Macias uh, in just a while. This is going to be led by Eric Stribling. He's an instructional professional with the Interplanetary Initiative. And uh, he's not with us today for a very good reason. He just had a baby. And so, hi, Eric, shout out to you. Hope all is well. Um, but as a spinoff of that space, space exploration and sustainable development project, um, the team recognized how central Earth observation satellite data is currently to how governments monitor progress towards many of the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And so this project proposes using satellite data to develop novel cutting edge indices for measuring achievement towards those UN SDGs by way of a student led faculty advised hackathon. If you are a faculty member that is interested in contributing and mentoring and guiding this project or a student interested in participating, we are still very much recruiting collaborators on this, on this very exciting project. And this is a hackathon that will happen in the spring of next year. So shifting gears, um, now we're gonna get into our uh, pilot projects uh, from this fiscal year. They are all wrapping up their work through the end of this month. And um, our, very, our first, um, sorry, two of these are gonna continue on. I just wanted to flag them. Earth Operations Center is gonna continue uh, its work through the next fiscal year, as well as the Space Exploration Sustainable Development Project. So our first project is Religious Space. It's been um, a really exciting and fascinating uh, pilot project, different from any, uh, any others that we funded to date. Uh, Phil Stays is um, the lead of this project. He is a facilitator, educator, and creator who works at the intersection of service and imagination. He got his master's in fine arts in theater directing from ASU back in 2017, where he focused on arts, science, and science collaboration, developing new works and applied creativity. His thesis project was a science and art festival in partnership with the Desert Botanical Gardens. Now, uh, for any of you who know Phil, his presence is always um, electrifying and, uh, and, and infectiously enthusiastic. Unfortunately, he's not here with us today, but he was kind enough to uh, send us a video uh, sharing his experience and his achievements um, while tackling this big question. What is the relationship between space and religion? Hi everyone, my name is Phil Stace and I'm the lead of Religious Space Pilot Project. And at the moment that you are watching this, I am on a plane um, flying to Colorado to get a little bit of cool air into my lungs. Um, so I'm gonna talk very briefly about Religious Space and some of the key accomplishments that we have done. Um, this past semester, we interviewed eight religious theorists and practitioners partially to understand their religious perspective and also to connect their perspective with what it means for space futures and things that we can learn from them about their religion beliefs based in space and what space exploration could mean to their religion. So we interviewed eight folks and transcribed those interviews. Um, we also designed a collection of about 20 pages. Each one is sort of like a nice, well-designed page um, that overviews a lot of different cosmologies and histories and religious rituals um, and cultural artifacts in the connection between religion and space. We had like 80 ideas, but we only had time to sort of design 20 of them in sort of a coffee table book style of showing how rich and full the intersection between religion and space is. Um, we also did an undergraduate survey of about 350 um, undergraduates asking them about what is their image of a god or deity or spirit? What is their image of space and how they understand space? And what is the relationship between them and their religious or spiritual beliefs, them and space and sort of connection? So a lot of sort of... Um, trying to understand how people think about these connections. Um, we also hosted an interreligious story circle with about six um, religions represented. And we had a conversation about how religion shows up in people's lives and what it means to them. And then also drew some connections between those things and what um, needs 
and ideas and rituals we could carry into um, space features and what that could mean. Um, and lastly, we hosted a panel discussion with three scholars of religious belief and history um, with a focus on indigenous knowledge and cosmology and belief. Um, and this panel was really, really fun. And it interrogated a lot of the models of sort of staunch capitalism and expansion ideas into space um, and invited us to think more about community and human needs and try to imagine space as an extension of how we have a relationship with ourselves and our relationship with our histories on this planet. Um, so it was really fun. So what's next for us is we are bringing the project to a close. Um, we're going to be writing a white paper about a lot of the different work, um, sharing some results from the uh, studies that we did and the design collections and sort of um, calling it a beautiful pilot project. So um, thank you so much and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Okay. Um, thank you, Phil, from the airplane. Um, so here's Phil's contact information. If you would like to connect with him and learn more and maybe build on some of the work that uh, he's done. And uh, we are going to put in the chat, I believe, there you go, uh, a link to the webinar that Phil hosted to uh, sort of wrap up this project. I uh, highly recommend listening in. Okay, so moving on, I'd like to um, uh, introduce Lauren Gold, who will be giving us an update on five senses in space. And um, before I do, I just want to say this is, of course, a longstanding project that we've supported. It is in many ways a shining sort of uh, example of success as far as what we look for in our pilot projects. And, um, and so I'll let sort of Lauren speak to all of the great things that the project has accomplished and delivered. Uh, but a little bit about Lauren. She's uh, an XR researcher and developer in the School of Arts, Media and Engineering, immersive, uh, studying immersive mobile technology. Her interest is in virtual reality data visualization, especially as it relates to planetary science. She's currently participating in a year-round student researcher program at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where she will assist in designing and developing visualization tools for current and future Mars mission operations. She's been instrumental in the success of this project. So thank you, Lauren, for being here and over to you. Thank you, Jessica, for the introduction. Um, hi, everybody, I'm Lauren. I am filling in for Dr. Lee Kamwa today. And I will be presenting our pilot project five to in space. So our big question is, how do we galvanize public and private support for space exploration? And we have a few um, accomplishments that I'd like to highlight today. So first our photogrammetry pipeline. We've been working on automating our pipeline so that now we can quickly download masses of rover images, convert them into the format that we need to build the 3D models and then export those models to the cloud so that our AR and VR applications can access these models on the fly. Um, the result is a fully virtualized digital twin of Mars for any data that we can get access to. Um, next on, oh, actually, uh, previous slide, please. Thank you. Um, the JMARS augmented reality app um, is on the in Google Play Store and the Apple App Store. We've been continuing to send updates to that. And um, we've also been building out a VR version of JMARS, uh, which will run on the MetaQuest headset and eventually be built out to the Oculus Store. In the bottom left corner, uh, I have a Dreamscape logo because we built a virtual reality experience called Journey to Mars. Um, and we, we leveraged the Dreamscape Learn facility at ASU to build this immersive experience. This is unlike our other VR experiences because um, the, the Dreamscape uh, facility allows much more immersivity like um, wind and rumbling floors and hand and feet trackers. So 
it's a super immersive environment and it's really cool. If you ever get the chance to check it out, you totally should. Um, it's called Journey to Mars. And last but not least, our Mars simulated habitat um, down there in the bottom right corner. It has been, so this is a physical trailer that exists um, in an ASU parking lot somewhere. And it's a, a simulated habitat of life on Mars. Uh, we 3D scanned it and fully virtualized it to put on the web. Uh, during the pandemic, we realized no one could go in and see this habitat in person. And so that's why we 3D scanned it and put it on the web, which you can move around and go in it and get a photorealistic version of the, the original uh, Mars habitat um, from your desktop anywhere in the world. And what's next is the Mars on the Field project that was mentioned earlier. Um, this is going to take place on the Sun Devil Stadium fields. Um, and basically we're turning the football field into Mars. Uh, so as users walk from end zone to end zone, the field will transform from our telescope based understanding of Mars to our modern rover orbiter based understanding to a glimpse of our future human-based exploration and settlement of Mars. And to learn more about this project or get involved, please contact the project lead, Robert Lee Kalma. Here's his contact info. So thank you. Thank you, Lauren. I will echo Lauren's invitation to explore uh, Journey to Mars. Um, I had a chance to See an earlier version, I understand it's even better now uh, in our creativity common space at ASU. So um, yes, please do check it out, it's incredible. Moving on to our next project, Integrating Space in the Local Economy. This is a project uh, that has been led from the ASU side by Dr. Uh, Timi Aganaba. Um, she is not able to join us today, so um, we're really thrilled to have um, Micah Walter Range, who is the president of Kalis Partners. Kalis Partners was a very critical collaborator on this project and, um, and I think uh, will lead to some pretty exciting outcomes and really look forward to hearing uh, from Micah uh, on that. But a little bit about Micah's background. Um, so he builds partnerships and financial vehicles that support the economic development needed on earth to enable new commercial activities in space. And among these activities, he created the Stock Index for the world's only exchange, exchange traded fund that focuses on space and it trades both on US and European markets. So with that, Micah, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today and to tell us about this exciting project. All right, thanks, Jessica. And, uh, and I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Aganaba for bringing us in on this project. It, it was an arrangement that I think worked really well because she and the ASU students, of course, brought the academic perspective and Kalis Partners brought our operational experience from working with the space industry globally to address this very big question. You know, what are the governance and economic structures we can use to best integrate space into a local economy using the case of Arizona? And the question was constructed to really, yes, use Arizona as a case study, but also to develop principles that can be applied across the planet so, you know, listening to Theodora talk about emerging space economies got me thinking, and, and Theodora, we should probably have a chat sometime soon. Uh, next slide, please. So the work itself was a combination of research and stakeholder dialogue. On the research side, we dug into what people have tried in Arizona with respect to space. And obviously, Arizona has space research and space companies, but it's not really organized in the way that other states are, you know, the ones that are thought of as space states. And we also looked at, you know, what are the driving forces in Arizona's economy? You know, whether you're talking about traditional ones, the five C's, <clears throat> five C's, uh, you know, cattle, citrus, climate, copper, and cotton, or whether you're talking about the more modern Arizona economy, you know, that includes retail, healthcare, manufacturing, and so on. And, and in talking with stakeholders, both through one-on-one -on -one interviews and through a stakeholder workshop that we hosted uh, with uh, about 40 or 50 participants, um, it became clear that space is not viewed as integral to the Arizona economy. 
it, it is isolated rather than integrated. And this is partly why there is a demand for projects like Mars on the field. If everyone just knew, well, space, obviously, you know, that's something we see every day. It's something we use every day. There would be less of a reason to do that outreach and to communicate that to the public. So clearly there's a lot of work to be done and you know, great to see these other projects moving forward on that too. Ultimately, what we concluded is a different approach is needed if the space industry is going to really deliver on its promises. And so ultimately, it must integrate with this local economy to create value and become financially self-sustaining. And what we mean by that is, you know, no longer dependent on, you know, can you get this government grant or contract? You know, can you get this venture capitalist to put money in because that has effects on a space company's development? You know, how do you do it in a way that can be really self-sustaining for the long term? Next slide, please. So where do we go from here? Um, there are four different areas, and, and all of them include investment-oriented features. Um, so looking at innovation and R&D, there are huge opportunities for the universities in Arizona to take the innovation and R&D assets and then really work with the private sector on a commercialization transition plan. And I know the universities already do work on this front. How do you, how do you spin out that technology? But you know, we're looking at it from the perspective of saying, from the investment side, what mechanisms can you put in place to facilitate that? On the workforce development side, there is incredible demand. There are shortages in the space industry workforce. So, you know, how do we create these opportunities to, to really make that easy transition um, from education directly into the workforce? Uh, on the investment side, multiple types of financial vehicles are needed. Um, you know, debt, equity, grant, you know, how do you, how do you build those structures? How do you fund them? How do you get them up and running? And then related to that, how do you put the policies and governance in place um, to, to really make sure that that's done again in a sustainable way, not an extractive way. So, you know, how did we go? Uh, next, I would say this is a, a project that did graduate. And so it's been picked up at the output by the Arizona Spaceport Alliance. They're working with other uh, stakeholders and, uh, and working on developing some of those financial vehicles. So uh, happy to talk about it uh, some more with anyone who's interested. Yeah, this was really, I'm sorry, thank you so much, Micah. This is really tremendous work accomplished in a very short amount of time. Uh, we were also able to get together uh, a number of stakeholders to sort of get these conversations um, uh, kicked up again, because there have been a lot of, you know, similar conversations happening in the past. And so we're really looking forward to seeing this gain some traction. And uh, it sounds like it is. And, uh, and also thank you, Micah, for connecting the dots with some of the other things that we're doing uh, within the project portfolio that we're advancing. I think that's super important for us to take advantage of the synergies um, in all that we do. And so um, I appreciate uh, you making those connections. So um, here's the contact information. Sorry, um, Timmy Aganaba, if you do want to uh, learn more and get involved. Thank you, Sally. And um, let's move on to our Earth Operations Center project. And this is a project that has been, that we've been working on for a number of years. Uh, Jake Pinholster is the project lead. For today, Matt uh, Sossen is going to be presenting. We're really thankful uh, to have Matt here today um, to talk about the progress of the project and where it's going next year. A little bit about Matt. He's a mixed reality artist and XR researcher pursuing a master's in fine arts in interdisciplinary digital media performance at ASU. His interest is in exploring new technology in relation to the arts and finding new methods of storytelling using artist consumer interaction and immersive elements. He's um, excited, and as we are as well, to con be continuing on, uh, on this project as project manager to envision new facilities of stewardship for our planet. Thank so, you for that Max. wonderful introduction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so our, I'm, I'm very happy to be here as project coordinator for Earth Operations Center, um, filling in for Jake, who couldn't be here today, and hoping, hopefully uh, giving you guys a, a great introduction to our continued uh, project uh, in this space. So our big question was, how do we become better stewards of Spaceship Earth, which is a tough question. And part of our answer is establishing an organization that is going to be dedicated to the development of Earth systems modeling and economic modeling, and to embed these results in a physical visualization environment that can inform and shape decision making. 
Uh, doing this is not just critical to our current battles with climate change on this planet, but is also critical to the future of mankind's ability to understand and manage the complex planetary systems that we might discover and manage elsewhere. And the goal of this project is to create such a space in both physical and virtual forms. We had a lot of uh, really wonderful accomplishments this year. And if you press the space bar, it might play that video. And we can turn the sound off if you want but we'll just keep it playing um, through this presentation until the next slide. Um, we were able to, as you see there, make a fully realized prototype VR experience of the virtual facet of this project uh, with controls and systems enabled. Uh, we were able to demo this experience to the public. As you can see on the left here, we won the Social Impact Award at the DIY uh, Maker Fest in Mesa, which was really wonderful, able to demo it um, and have all uh, ranges of, of age and, and types of folks experience um, the initial VR Earth Operations Center. We had a citation in the World Economic Forum, so starting to get the idea of the Earth Operations Center out there into the global community, into uh, the, the uh, minds of researchers and other academics, and then starting to develop out architectural concepts uh, with Professor Bree Smith, um, everything from textures to individual rooms in an Earth Operations Center to entire buildings. Uh, next slide. What's next? Um, this is gonna be a really big year for us. Uh, we have a pending huge partnership to get real world uh, data of um, climate data into our system that then we can incorporate and start working with different kinds of researchers to visualize in our VR uh, prototype and then um, incorporate that data visualization into the architectural uh, simulation of the EOC as well. Um, we're going to be releasing the virtual reality experience through the Oculus Store and Meta, and Meta uh, to have uh, even more eyes on it um, and more analytics of the experience as people experience it um, worldwide. Um, we are going to be building out an architectural design of the project, so focusing on the uh, physical space um, this year uh, that's based on the VR experience as a prime um, incorporated element of the real world architectural design. Um, so working with folks at ASU and um, industry partners outside of that. And then expanding our partnerships um, that we already have with NASA and MIT and presenting our findings at conferences and in publications, as well as developing an experience with Dreamscape Learn. So if you wanna get involved uh, with the Earth Operations Center, we'd love to talk to you. Just reach out to the project lead, Jake Pinholster um, at this email address. Thank you, Matt. Um, I agree with you. This is going to be a big year for this project. There are you know, uh, from more and more sort of things that I'm seeing and reading about the need for creating a digital twin of the earth to have all of these really important insights um, and to take action. So um, really critical work. And thank you again for joining us today. Um, and so we're doing great on time. And uh, I'm going to introduce our uh, final project that has been um, uh, going on this year. They've actually been working on this project for a short amount of time, maybe, I don't know, uh, Maddie, maybe nine months. And they've been doing just an incredible amount of work. And this is the Space Exploration and Sustainable Development Project. So Eric Stribling is the project lead. Um, as I mentioned earlier, he's off on paternity leave, but we are in uh, great hands with uh, Maddie Macias. And I do want to um, say that Maddie's been a rock star on this project, leading a team of undergraduate students to do some really deep and, and sprawling work. So a little bit about Maddie. She is an urban and environmental planning graduate student interested in justice, sustainability, and resilience within city planning. She's a graduate research assistant for the Interplanetary Initiative working on this particular project. And she also works as a researcher in the re-engineered lab at uh, ASU, where uh, she investigates justice and sustainability challenges that exist within the fields of, of uh, engineering and science. She holds a bachelor's of science degree in mechanical engineering. And Madison, thank you so, Maddie, thank you so much for being with us. And it's been really, really a, a joy working with you for the last several months. Oh, thank you, Jessica. You're too kind. 
It's been great working under Eric Stribling and Diana Ayn Schenker. She's kind of our Leonardo lead to ask this big question. How does space exploration and development impact progress towards achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals? And to answer this question, we did what's known as a rapid review, which is a type of systematic literature review done in a really short amount of time, but meant to kind of have a really broad reach. And moving on to the next slide, you can see that through this rapid review, over the last odd so months, we've gone over 12,000 pieces of academic literature, and we've done so with uh, myself and four other undergrads who were great to work with. And we essentially found from this academic literature that there are four spheres of impact that intersect with the space industry and achieving those UN SDGs. The first sector that we see is satellite data, remote sensing and earth observations. So we see that a lot of this data can be used to make important decisions, especially for countries that don't necessarily have access to do population counts or to do other demographic information like that on a grander scale. And that's kind of what ended up contributing to Space Hack. So that's a really cool spinoff project that we're excited about. The second sector is looking at new manufacturing capabilities. So everything from medicine to um, material manufacturing, it's different in space because of the different gravitational properties and material properties. So that can really help achieve some of the UN SDGs. The third one is spin-off te spin technologies, which we like to refer to as the Velcro effect. So if you aren't aware, uh, Velcro was developed by NASA actually back in the 50s or 60s, and then it ended up trickling down to earth. So we see that continue to happen even now in the present with um, just different space industries developing technology. And a lot of these technologies are actually very applicable to sustainability here on earth. And then finally, the social implications. We're seeing uh, a lot of social implications, both negative and positive, emerge from space exploration. So for instance, as space exploration and development is continuing to expand, we do still see a large gender gap and also a, an equity gap as far as economic social status gap as who is able to go to space, especially with like commercial space tourism and things like that. And moving on to next phase of our project, for um, first off, right now is happening is a Leonardo and SESD um, kind of joint exhibit in Barcelona. And Diana has been a great leader for that. Um, it's gonna be a part of the digital awareness for Esperanceta's exhibit. And what this is, is it's gonna be a virtual reality exhibit and it features planets for each of the SDGs. And then uh, participants can go to each planet and kind of see an artwork that was hand selected that kind of explores the connection between space and the SDG. So it's very, very cool. Um, that should be in the chat if you guys wanna check that out. And then right now we're also working on a publication that's kind of compiling the specific academic literature we reviewed for each SDG, going over those sectors that kind of emerged as well as some other sectors that were a little bit less prominent, but still very important. And then for the second phase of our project, we want to hopefully look at industry implication and practices. So we wanna see what are space firms and industries doing now in practice and how can we inform that and how can we kind of help guide that towards more sustainable practice and how we can help them achieve the UN SDGs through their work. And yeah, that's it. Um, if you're interested, please reach out to Eric at eStribley at ASU.edu. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maddie. And um, so there are two spin-off projects, um, as we mentioned, the Space Hacks for Sustainability, and also one project that I mentioned earlier that is connecting with Theodora's work, looking at how those spin-off technologies can influence and garner sort of public support in emerging space uh, faring nations. Uh, so um, really great, great work. And I, I think the last thing I'll say here is if you are a CSR expert, we are looking for um, additional collaborators uh, on this particular project. So um, with that, we are, uh, we were super efficient and I want to thank all of you for joining the webinar today um, and getting a good sampling of um, the various projects that we're supporting. I wanna thank all of the presenters for taking the time and being so succinct and effective in sharing your work. Uh, that is really appreciated. And then for everyone, um, there's a lot going on at Interplanetary. Uh, we encourage you to subscribe. There's the QR code here for our monthly newsletter, uh, but you can always get in touch with us anytime at interplanetary at ASU.edu. 
Uh, we are all about collaborating, creating new networks and engaging really broadly across cultures and expertise and sectors. So you are all welcome to join our efforts. And then um, mark, our mark your calendar. So our next uh, project transmission webinar will be September 9th from 11 to 12 p.m. Arizona time. Um, and I think that wraps up uh, our session and we'll give you back all of six minutes to your busy days. Thank you so much. And till next time.